Hello everyone, this is update for November 15, 2022, day 265 of the war and of the date update. <clears throat> so, uh, first of all, uh, today was uh, probably one of the largest attack uh, on Ukrainian energy or electricity distribution infrastructure. So the hits were uh, in Kyiv, around Kyiv, then Zhutoma region, then Lviv, Rivne, uh, I think a little bit in Khmelnytsky, Vinnytsia, and then Kremenchuk, uh, Kryurikh. So basically, pretty much most of the country. So at this point, there was definitely a heavy damage to the um, those uh, substations or transformers that basically connect the whole energy uh, generation system into one into one system, electricity distribution system. So uh, there are reports about 100, at least 100 uh, rockets being fired by the Russian side. Uh, they, were, uh, they were coming throughout the day in about like four waves. Uh, and as I said, the damage is extremely uh, heavy. So it remains to be seen if this system will be able to sort of restart as one system. Uh, definitely like uncontrollable blackouts throughout the country and, and, and things like that of that nature. As uh, part of this whole attack, so there were there was a report that two Russian uh, rockets hit uh, Polish territory, killing two Polish farmers. And the hit was uh, somewhere like in this area. This is Lublin uh, region of Poland. Uh, so let's actually look uh, at the result of this attack. So as you can see this uh, crater uh, from the explosion, it's, uh, after looking at this, it's definitely not, uh, not a Russian rocket. It's not five, 500 kilogram of high explosive. It's something much smaller. Uh, so giving this the more likely scenario that this is actually uh, anti-missile rocket that's being fired by Ukrainian uh, defense system, uh, anti-air um, uh, defense system, and it just uh, didn't go where it's supposed to go. That's more likely scenario. I'm not saying it's for sure because there is not enough evidence, there is not enough investigation, but it based on this, you know, small, you know, just this picture, it's uh, definitely not uh, typical Russian rocket, which has about 500 kilogram of uh, high, ex you know, of, of explosive. Let's put this way, because if if it if it were to hit this this tractor, this whole thing would be simply not like annihilated, but it would be uh, totally destroyed, and the crater would be much larger, deeper, and and, and larger in diameter. So, uh, so it looks like uh, this this is uh, you know, as I said, not. Uh, not sort of Russian strike. However, there is uh, Polish government co called uh, Russian amb uh, ambassador, uh, and then there is uh, National Defense Council being gathered in Poland, and then there is more uh, uh, on the 16. There is a NATO meeting to decide what to do about all of this. Uh, like, in my view, it's definitely like, you know, World War Three is not happening. Nobody wants to escalate. So this is just going to be swiped under the rug and just everybody will just move on. Essentially, this is probably what's going to happen uh, in uh, this whole situation. So and I uh, forgot to mention another collateral damage of this Russian uh, attacks. Uh, there is a crude oil pipeline that goes from Russia to Europe and it goes through Ukraine. It's called Druzhba. So it stopped uh, pumping oil through that pipe pipeline, which goes to actually, uh, it goes through the Carpathia to Hungary, which is uh, here where I'm basically a little bit more towards the West. Uh, so um, we'll see if it affects supply of uh, crude and uh, you know, gasoline and diesel fuel situation in Europe. But for now, it stopped. It was one of the major uh, supply routes of Russian crude to Europe uh, that's still working at this time. Uh, but it's possible that um, it might be repaired and, and, and everything's going to go back to sort of normal there. Uh, 
so this is sort of relate like you know everything related to all of the strikes that uh, as we can see creating uh, for sure some collateral damage right uh, and uh, this whole situation threatens to get out of control in terms of um, other countries being involved into the, in this war even though technically everybody understands that you know it's a war of west versus you know let's say russia and china and iran uh, at the same time there is no sort of like direct involvement um so uh then going a little bit uh, moving to uh russia and i mentioned yesterday that there were a meeting of the um, russian equivalent of caa uh with the us caa and uh, it wasn't clear what they were discussing, and then the Russian head of this, uh, it's called SV, uh, SVR, um, it's, uh, I think, literal translation is uh, external intelligence service. Uh, then, you know, after that uh, negotiation, the head of it, Patrushev, who is basically one of the inner circle of the Russian president, who basically in, involved and uh, in whole decision making at the highest level, then he left. Then he went to Iran, um, but today he he gave some you know speech where basically he criticized U.S. claiming that uh, it's trying to use Ukraine to destroy Russia and so on. So it's just kind of like typical um, uh, Russian sort of propaganda or Russian point of view on this situation, which again tells that that negotiation that happened yesterday uh, there was there wasn't much achieved basically so apparently it was um you know basically a big flop there uh then um uh, let's uh, discuss next topic and it's a uh, grain deal so it looks like grain deal is uh, almost essentially done so unless something sort of sudden drastic happens, uh, it's probably going to be extended. And uh, just a reminder, it expires on November 18th, so it's pretty much almost there. Uh, what Russia gets, uh, so Russia basically gets what it wants, uh, which means, uh, first of all, unblocking of Russian uh, fertilizer export around the world. Uh, that's one thing. Uh, because there was a lot of Russian fertilizers seized in Western Europe, in, in the Netherlands, and so on. And so now it's being, you know, sort of sold uh, to, to around the world. Uh, as a part of this deal, uh, actually, uh, VAST even proposes to Russia to restart export of ammonia. So basically, there's like a pipeline that goes through Ukraine to Odessa. It's from, um, from the town called Talyati, which I think is on Volga. Uh, there is a pipeline that's carrying ammonia and a new basic ammonia is kind of like a key ingredient uh, for uh, nitrogen based uh, uh, fertilizer. I think it's usually called urea or something like that. So it's basically a component. Uh, and uh, then it, it comes through the pipeline to Odessa and then it's being, there is actually um, uh, processing facility in that port factory then then it makes actual uh, uh, fertilizer basically so uh, looks like there is encouragement and sort of guarantees from the West uh, basically kind of like almost asking Russia to restart export of this ammonia that allows to have more fertilizer uh, on the market uh, in addition uh, there's another concession so if you remember I spoke about that uh, Ross Silhos bank which is Russian Agricultural Bank in translation. So uh, it will be allowed to use essentially uh, SWIFT in a very limited way. Basically, it will have bank uh, correspondent uh, on the US side and all of the payments will go through that bank. So it's kind of like very super limited, but it will be able to sort of carry out, uh, you know, payments for the, all of this export uh, operations. So essentially, as I said, Russia will be able to renew uh, the, its grain exports. So we probably will see sort of some reprieve uh, on the global um, sort of food and agricultural markets as a result of all of this situation. Uh, now uh, let's talk a little bit more about Russia. I mentioned that 
um, internally Russian econ uh, economy. And I'm not talking about all of this sort of commodity exports, right? Because Russia is a big exp exporter of crude oil, you know, um, coal, natural gas, even though natural gas right now, na gas right now it's going to be on the low, you know, essentially blocked. Uh, and then obviously agriculture commodities and uh, fertilizers, which is essentially, um, you know, uh, derivative of natural gas. But beyond this sort of traditional uh, export uh, categories, uh, Russian economy in internally is doing pretty terribly. And this is actually reflect, there are numbers for the uh, rental prices uh, in Moscow for one bedroom. Uh, the numbers came and I believe that's for October. So it shows that uh, the prices fell 18.2%. That's, you know, probably everybody realized it's a huge number for rental. Usually rentals are the most sticky, stickiest prices. They almost never go down because there's all, always, and pretty much everywhere around, you know, Wherever you go, there is simply not enough of this uh, rental apartments or whatever you know, whatever whatever it is in, in around the world. So it's always sort of you know uh, something that uh, where the price is very stable and they just usually go in one direction higher. So this is uh, tells that the market, the labor market, is in terrible condition uh, in Moscow. And as I said before, Moscow is essentially um like economic hard brain and everything in one package of Russia where essentially um, most of the not actual economic activity but more where most of the finances uh, of the country accumulated right and then most of the headquarters so so everything is like super concentrated business wise in Moscow. So if it falls in Moscow, uh, it's it's sort of really a bad sign. But however, there is interesting uh, another interesting detail in uh, in Saint Petersburg, which is essentially like a second capital of Russia, uh, but it's definitely no match, not even close to uh, to Moscow. Uh, prices fell by eleven point nine percent, so roughly twelve percent, uh, like you know what a third less than in Moscow. So, but as you can see, the, the whole magnitude of all of these drops is uh, extremely significant and just tells about the pain inside the, for Russian consumer and for the, on the in the Russian uh, labor market. Um, that's, uh, I think that's it in terms of the sort of general, oh, and then one, another, another uh, data point that came out from China uh, retail sales uh, in October year on year in China fell by uh, 0.5%. This is also extremely unusual number for China because um, because it's usually it's just grows, grows and grows, grows and nothing but grows. Uh, and again, this is what I've been sort of saying here. There is slow motion internal implosion happening in Chinese economy that's uh, in terrible shape and and then as I discussed before again uh, there is part that's export oriented that's suffering and then there is part that's sort of more internal consumer that's basically financed uh, by you know borrowing against real estate and so on uh, just basically living off uh, real estate bubble so that is broken because as you can see uh, it's actually started to fall um, so situation in Chinese economy is uh, pretty bad and uh, it doesn't look for the sort of the rest of the world in, in, in many ways there is no realization how bad it is uh, there economy wise uh, now let's uh, now let's actually switch to the battlefield situation in Ukraine and we're going to do quick walks through in a uh, clockwise fashion starting from very north so uh, situation uh, along the state border uh, was a little bit more heated because uh, Ukrainian side was trying to do retaliation attacks against the Russian infrastructure uh, you know near the border so it was a little bit uh, on the higher end but still uh, 
fairly uh, quiet. Uh, now let's move to North Luhansk uh, front line. Things here are almost sort of unchangeable. So attacks and counter attacks here near Kuzemivka by you know, first attacks by Ukrainian side and counter attack by Russian side. The end result um, status quo no changes and then also this futile attempts here by Ukrainian troops to basically get the river and cut through into two halves Russian defensive position which is again uh, doesn't go anywhere at this point. Uh, now let's move to North and Bas front line. Uh, things here are somewhat looks like a quieter. Not sure if Wagner mercenaries are regrouping or whatever it is, uh, but they were just kind of like sort of regular uh, attacks uh, against Solidar, Bakhmut, and a little bit here near Belohorivka. But overall, uh, the activity is definitely uh, much much lower than it usually is. As you can see, just almost three major points of attack but this whole southern sort of sector is was relatively quiet uh, now let's move to central donbass front line uh, things here are a little bit more active actually uh, so as you can see russian command uh, is sort of feeling that uh, opportunity to uh, outflank of Divka is coming sort of more, becoming more and more realistic so it's trying to actively develop this um, salient here in sort of, you know, this northwestern direction and sort of western, well, I guess southwestern direction. And then continuing attacks here out of Piski salient. Uh, then there's again attacks in Marinka, which never go to anywhere. This also attacks didn't go, by the way, anywhere. Uh, then uh, attacks Nova Mikhailivka. And then there were no attacks in Pavlivka. And uh, there's actually a very interesting uh, situation developing on uh, the Russian side around the Spavlivka, where, if you remember, there were very high losses uh, at the initial stage uh, by the Russian brigade, specifically 155th and the 40th brigade. So, sort of, 40th brigade was kind of like covering the flank. So, the main sort of striking force was 155th brigade. Uh, and uh, the 40th was kind of covering the flank. So as I said, there were heavy losses. Uh, so it looks like a Russian sort of command and Russian top decided to find sort of scapegoat for this, I would say, uh, Pyrrhic uh, victory or basically a failure essentially because they got something that's worth nothing or actually negative value because now uh, Russian troops under constant artillery fire in Pavlivka, uh, which probably leads to uh, additional heavy losses. But basically the point is, is that uh, the commander of the 40th uh, Naval Infantry Brigade looks like he's going to be uh, jailed for the failure of this attack. And basically whole blame was put on him and he made, you know, scapegoat that he was not moving you know, fast enough, not supporting 155th Brigade and so on. So um, it's very interesting situation because it's in, in a way uh, another sign of the, um, let's say, problem and desperation on the Russian side uh, when they blame, you know, essentially middle level commander that uh, was simply executing what he was told but because the mistake was done by actually uh, at the highest level of the Russian command that decided to uh, capture something that has actually, as I said, negative value. Uh, but instead, it's the blame basically being deflected to someone at the middle level. Um, so it reminds the, the this, uh, Soviet army in June, July and August of the 1941, where essentially, uh, again, middle level commanders were blamed for mistakes of the higher military command um, now let's uh, move a little bit uh, let, let's move to the parisia front line things here are uh, almost quiet i want to say except there was russian attack uh, against essentially velika novosilka uh, this is actually second time that's been happening here in over the course of the months uh, it's unclear if this is going to be uh area of the you know where the russian troops are going to be seeking sort of uh success by trying to essentially um you know attack 
north and, and essentially kind of force Ukrainian troops out of this whole area around Vuhledar, Novomikhailivka, that where Russian troops are not successful, and then obviously Velika Novosilka. So this is kind of like one big sort of uh, defense uh, region. Let me actually look, uh, let me just go back here. I guess this whole area, it's kind of like one sort of interconnected system. Uh, and the problem for the Russian side that they, Bugledar is, is super hard to take because it on the higher ground, as I explained again, then Russian troops are not successful again at this Novomikhailivka. So they're trying to do something in this uh, Velika Novosilka uh, <clears throat> to essentially kind of like destroy this kind of like a southern flank of Ukrainian troops. But so far it's, uh, as I say, bridges too far. Uh, otherwise, everything, you know, quiet on this former uh, Kherson sort of front line, no essential news. Um, there are some reports that some of the units are being redeployed, still unclear where and, and so on. So as things and, and, you know, as units will be redeployed and, and things will get sort of hotter uh, on this main remaining front line. Uh, I will be providing those updates. Uh, thanks for watching and until tomorrow. Bye-bye.